rig your ML downwind poles correctly and save your mast. Hello everybody, Captain Bill Kinney here, and today we're going to talk about an important topic, how to correctly set up your ML downwind poles for safe and comfortable downwind sailing. An ML Super Maramu and a few other models from ML are some of the very few boats that are designed to sail straight downwind with speed and comfort. The twin head sails used in this rig are not unique to a mill, but the articulated poles and the ability to furl the two sails on the single foil make this setup really easy to use. There are two parts to rigging the ML downwind pole system that need to be implemented correctly to be efficient and safe. First, rig the lines properly. And second, use the right lines. Doing it correctly is very important. Mistakes here can be serious, leading to damage, broken parts, up to and including dismastings, and resulting in possible injuries and even death. It's that important, so let's get this right. Unfortunately, there's been some bad advice circulating on the internet about how to rig the ML downwind poles. This system is different than a standard whisker pole. And there's a lot more engineering in the setup than might be immediately apparent to the casual observer. I certainly learned a lot about it as I went through this analysis. For the impatient sailors out there, here are the important take-home points. One, rig the four guy and all the pole control lines exactly as Emil recommends. If you do not know what that looks like, download a copy of the Super Maramu manual and read it carefully. Two, use 14 millimeter nylon double braid for the control lines, except the topping lift, that should be 10 millimeter polyester. Only nylon has the stretch needed to make this system work as it should. Do not use Dacron and really do not use low stretch high tech line like Dyneema or Spectra. For the rest of you interested in the whys and wherefores and details, let's dive into a bit of reverse engineering. But first, just a few seconds of business. Please help other people find this video by liking it and subscribing to the channel. If you want to participate in making more of these, go to my Patreon page. It's in the list below. I use all the proceeds to make more and better videos. Thanks a lot. Now, back to the fun. Through the miracle of computer graphics, we are going to take a look at this system and how it should be rigged and why Amel's recommendations should be adhered to. Let's start with a photo from directly overhead taken of Super Maramu number 160, Harmony. That's our girl. Let's remove all the distracting elements and give ourselves a clean background. Move the boat in the frame so we have room in the direction we're going to be working. We're going to do our analysis in two dimensions. I've done parts of this in the full three-dimensional layout and convinced myself that the differences we are going to be discussing are actually larger in three dimensions than using the flat projection. However, the 3D math is so complex it will distract from the conclusion and really not change anything. With two-dimensional analysis, we can skip the higher math and three-dimensional trigonometry and just use a little tiny bit of algebra. Don't worry, it's not scary. Okay, so here's our picture. Let's put a scale size downwind pole out as if it was in use. Note that the pole on this early Super Maramu is going to be about half a meter longer than newer ones. Again, that's not going to change anything we're discussing. Now that we have a pole, let's add a four guy to the system rigged as Amel recommends. This one will show in blue. It runs from the pole forward to a block attached to the forwardmost stanchion and then back to the cleat on the cabin top deck. Its total length from cleat to pole is 11.22 meters. The alternative method, which is not recommended, runs from the pole to the forwardmost cleat on the tow rail. This will be shown in red. Its total length is 5.66 meters. I've never figured out what the rationale for this change is. While the cleat is arguably a stronger attachment point, the more acute angle increases the loads on this line 
on the pole and on the mast. But we will shortly see it's the shorter length of this line that's the real problem. In normal downwind sailing, the loads on the foreguy are minimal. Where you lead it really doesn't matter much. But things can go wrong. The system was designed to accommodate these issues. Changes to the rigging of the system that look fine in normal use can completely eliminate safety factors built in to accommodate events that might not be normal, but have to be expected to happen if you sail long enough. The two events we will consider here are a pole dipping into the water while sailing at speed and a sudden wind shift or gust that catches the sail aback. In both cases, load on the four guy can go from small to huge in no time at all, as the end of the pole is pushed very hard toward the back of the boat. A pole dip into the water while sailing at eight knots is for all intents and purposes an irresistible force. Something has to give. Amel's design is such that the lines stretch and absorb this energy before it can cause serious damage. Let's look at how this works. When a pole is backwinded, it rotates around the swivel attached to the end of the short pole. As it swings back, the four guy starts to stretch longer and longer until it gets to this point right here. From here on, the four guy stops pulling the pole forward and starts pulling it toward the side of the boat. Depending on the exact setting of the topping lift, the pole will hit the rub rail or the life rail or the mizzen forward lower shroud. How much stretch is there and why does it matter? Well, using these graphics, we can actually measure and do some vector arithmetic to figure this out. For the ML recommended rig, the total length at maximum extension is 12.53 meters, a stretch of 1.31 meters, or 112% of the initial length. For the other rigging method, the total length at maximum extension is 6.60 meters, a stretch of 0.99 meters, or 118% of the original length. Our boat is equipped with the original lines that Amel supplied. We know they were a line branded as Tempest. Unfortunately, I've never been able to find any information on this line. If we had the elastic modulus of the rope, we could calculate the forces involved here. I did not have that data, so I measured it with a high load crane scale and a winch. I collected data for the amount of stretch versus the load on the line. If my data was good, I'd expect this data to be in a straight line. That's pretty darn good if I say so myself. The maximum load I could measure was about 240 kilograms, which gave me a stretch of about 2.5%. We're far enough below the breaking strength of the rope that we can extrapolate the straight line with reasonable expectations of accuracy. A stretch of 12% gives us a force of 1,100 kilos and 18% in a force of nearly 1,700 kilos, or about 155% of the load the system was designed for. So let's look at what this force is doing. This force is pulling the pole mostly forward. The only things to resist this force are the cap shroud and the two lower shrouds that the pole guide is attached to. I think we can all agree that more load sideways on shrouds is a bad thing. Certainly, a load high enough will pull the mast out of column, and it will collapse. How much? I don't know. I do know that the line rigged, as Amel suggests, can absorb the forces of a backwinded jib that is strong enough to push the pole all the way back to the rail. How do I know it? We've done it twice on Harmony, and as we can see, her mast is still vertical. If the forces are 50% higher, is that okay? I don't know. I'm not going to risk my boat on that guess. If stretching causes these problematic loads, maybe the right answer is to switch to something like Dyneema and eliminate the stretch almost completely. Well, let's see how that works. Because I've experienced a backwinding that pushed the pole all the way back to the rail, I know for sure there is at least 1,100 kilograms of force available. So to keep the pole from moving aft while the sail is taken aback, we need to pull forward with at least 1,100 kilograms of force. Let's do a bit of vector arithmetic here and see what results we get. 
1,100 kilograms of forward force requires a force on the line of 2,900 kilograms. That's not going to be a problem for 14 millimeter Dyneema, but that results in 2,700 kilograms in compression loading on the mast. Now, I don't know for an absolute certainty, but I'd bet you a bottle of 20-year-old single malt scotch that if you push sideways on a Super Maramu mast with a force of over two and a half tons, that mast will buckle and collapse. So just say no to Dyneema line. So that's my take on these things. I'm not at all surprised that Amel's engineering is so carefully thought out. They take a great deal of care with their boats and they do not do anything by guesswork. Their boats are in many ways different than the standard boat from the average boat builder. Those differences are not there for marketing or for looks or just an attempt to be different for its own sake. So appreciate the thought that went into these boats, appreciate the differences and respect them. So be careful and be safe. Now, since I recorded the above, I've learned more about the rope that Amel used in the control lines for the Super Maramu. The Tempest is made by the French company Lancel and Cordage, a part of Samson Rope Company. Although this rope is of a different construction than I expected, its performance specifications are pretty much exactly as I expected, with only one difference. Based on Lancelin's catalog, we know that the Tempest is a core-dependent polyester rope with a spun polyester cover and a polyester filament, filament core. Normally, lines of this construction are very strong and low stretch, but that's not the case here. The 14 millimeter Tempest has a breaking strength of only 1900 kilos. Consistent with other polyester lines, it's expected to stretch to 113% of its original length at the point where it breaks. A couple of recommendations. If you can get Tempest line from Lancelin, then use it. The much lower breaking strength is kind of an extra safety factor. Having the four guy break is unlikely to be a, as serious a problem and it prevents other damage in an unforeseen event. So, so much the better. If you're using this line and have a backwinding event or a pole dip that pushed the pole back to the hull, you've stretched this line to a point very close to its breaking strength. It has likely suffered some damage. I would replace it at your earliest convenience. So that's an addendum and hopefully it's all helpful to everybody. Be safe out there, have fun.